Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to Testing with Foundry. We are very excited for you all to be here. We're going to give it a couple minutes for people to join. Um, so I'm uh, seeing a couple of good mornings in the chat, good afternoons in the chat. Good morning and welcome. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. It's 7.30 Eastern, where I, I am right now. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. This is going to be a really, really powerful one. Working with Foundry again, right? Learning why this Foundry tool is so powerful, especially with this testing section, right? Because it's the testing where Foundry really, really shines with how quick the tests are, with how, which how, uh, with how powerful the tests are, uh, and with a lot of the built-in tools that they have, uh, like fuzzing, for example. So really excited for everyone to be here. Hello, hello. See everybody in the chat. Welcome. Uh, excited to go through this one here. So hopefully everybody is doing well. How are we doing, by the way? So it's Tuesday. We're a few days deep into the Chainlink Hackathon. How is everybody doing? How are we doing? How do we feel? We feel like we're learning a lot. Are we feeling like we're, we're, we're getting the swing of things? We're just kind of going to all the workshops to, to feel it out, figure out what's going on. How are we doing? Let's, uh, how are we doing in the chat? We'll give people a few minutes to join. Um, let, let, let me know how you're feeling in the chat. Curious. Is everyone learning a ton? Is everyone like, all right, I'm waiting for the for the bigger ones. Later on today, we have a really fantastic, uh, much longer workshop. So hopefully I see everybody at that as well. Yeah, how are we doing today? Learning, talking, and workshops. Okay, great. Been like an everyday grind. I love with this. Been trying to deal with the fact that I'll probably just have to install WSL. Um, yes, I highly recommend if you're on Windows, you install WSL. Uh, it, it'll it make your life a lot better, I promise. Need an extra three hours in the day, please. You and me both. Uh, you and me both. Oh, we got a question already? And then uh, we're probably going to get started in just a few minutes here. Uh, Patrick, does Foundry for Chainlink have anything to do with Plantier Foundry? I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. Um, I might have to look that up. You feel awesome. Excellent. Great. Learning a lot. Excited for today. Excellent. Doing great. Excited for Foundry. Excellent. 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 Uh, and remember, everybody, I'm going to post this in the chat here. Uh, please, at the end of this workshop, uh, please give us some feedback. Please fill out that form. Let us know how we did. Let us know if you like these, you didn't like them. You'd like us to switch it up um so that we can keep making sure that these are useful for you all keep making them better and better so please fill out the uh the feedback form uh when this has concluded so let's jump into the code shall we so we're two minutes past let's switch over to some code here all right so i'm already set up in a vs code here again we're using visual studio code uh if you hadn't seen kind of our intro to foundry or intro to to Brownie, definitely be sure to watch those videos as well, okay? Because uh, we talked about Visual Studio Code, we, we showed a little bit about the terminal and stuff, and I'm not going to uh, re-go over that here. Now, now that we're in our project, um, we have uh, Foundry installed, right? Forge dash dash help. We have Forge installed, we have Foundry installed, we could run Foundry up, of course, Foundry up, just to make sure we have the most latest and greatest. And cool, we can create a new project with Forge and it. And we boom, we go ahead and we create a new uh, a new forge, a new foundry project in here. Get modules, we have our foundry.toml, src, blah, blah, blah. Now, our contract.sol in here uh, is really boring. And if you went to our foundry workshop, um, what was it this weekend? This weekend, we did a little bit of testing. We did a little bit of testing there. Um, so in this, uh, in this workshop, we're going to get much more advanced. We're going to use some of Foundry's built-in tools to do really, really powerful testing. We're going to learn how we can test uh, with Chainlink smart contracts on our on our local blockchain. Because, of course, on our Foundry local chain, uh, when we run tests with Foundry, Foundry has no idea about Chainlink oracles, right? It has no idea what Chainlink oracles are, so we have to mock them. We have to pretend we, we're going to be a Chainlink node, uh, and that's what we're going to get into today. So let me grab... Uh, some code here. One second. So I have the wrong code up. Sorry. Let 
and then we'll jump in. All right, cool. All right, now for this code here, uh, we're going to do something a little bit more interesting than what we did yesterday, right? Yesterday, we did a simple contract.sol. We're going to make a really minimalistic contract. We're going to call our contract here. We're going to call it stake contract. And this is going to be a staking contract, right? Or it's going to be a very minimalistic staking contract. We're going to create a function called stake, and this is what we're going to test. And you'll notice we're actually going to do some really advanced testing here. So we're, I'm going to show you how to do, um, uh, yeah, uh, over the weekend, we did some basic testing. We're going to do fuzz testing here, and then we're going to learn how to do our mock testing, right? And then we're going to learn how to do that with Chainlink. So let's go ahead. Let's make a real minimalistic staking contract. So we'll create a function stake, which will take a UN256 amount, the address of a token. I can close all these for now. And this will be an external function. And we'll say it returns a Boolean. Returns a Boolean. And in our staking function, we'll have um, some set of balances that we'll need to update. So to keep track of those balances in our staking app, we'll have a mapping of an address to a UN256. This will be a public variable, and we'll call it S underscore balances. So uh, a little naming convention that's done is whenever you create a storage variable, you'll often see me in a lot of examples that we do, they start with S underscore. That's because any of these global variables, any of these state variables or, or what's known as storage variables are really expensive to read and write from. So when we prepend them with an S underscore, that's just an indicator, hey, as a, as a gas, has a gas conscientious uh, software engineer, oh, okay, if I'm reading and writing to this data structure, it's going to be really expensive. I should try to do this as little as possible. So that's kind of what that S underscore is, is telling us. This is a storage variable. Reading and writing to this is expensive. But so what we'll do, what we will do is we'll say S balances of message.sender, right? Because we're going to map uh, an address to how much they have staked. Um, and we'll say equals s balances message dot sender plus amount after we do that we will transfer those tokens to our stake contract so uh, in order to do that of course though we'll need to call transfer function of an erc20 token so our staking function allows us to to stake any token in our contract here and we're going to need to uh, call the transfer from function in order to send it to our contract here. So we're going to import from Open Zeppelin. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, Open Zeppelin is this phenomenal library uh, where you can grab a lot of different, um, a lot of different already built uh, contracts. One of them is an IERC twenty dot sol, an interface for an ERC twenty. Using this interface. Uh, we can we will be able to call different functions uh, when combined with an address. So we'll say import at open zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash erc20 slash ierc20 dot sol. And then if this part is confusing to anybody, obviously you know jump to the chat here, ask some questions. Now we're going to say uh, on this ierc20. This interface, right? If we go to contracts, uh, token, ERC20, IERC20, this is an interface, right? If we go to the transfer from function, it's not actually fully defined. That's what we want. So when we combine this with an address, we'll be able to call the transfer from uh, function on that address. So we'll say IERC20 of that token address that we're passing dot transfer from transfer from message.sender, right? Whoever's calling the stake function will send it to this address and using this amount. So this will do the transfer function. And then to make sure the transfer function goes through, um, we'll say Boolean success equals this because transfer from returns a Boolean, whether or not it was successful. And then we can just say, we could say require you know, success, or we can do like an if 
we can do an if not success, not success, um, then revert with like transfer failed. We can create a custom error. So we'd say like error state contract underscore underscore transfer failed. Like this, this, this is kind of a little bit more advanced, but it's really good. Uh, and then return success. So real minimalistic staking function here, right? So we pass in an amount of a token we want to stake on this contract. We pass in the address of a token we want to stake. Uh, we update our balances with that additional uh, token. We actually transfer the tokens to this contract. Uh, and then if that transfer doesn't go through, we revert. We, we revert everything in this transaction with our little custom error that we made. Uh, any questions so far? The more I see a mapping function, uh, the more I have no clue. Can anyone explain to me how does it work? Um, yes. Uh, I'm going to drop you a link here. A solidity body example doesn't actually have one. Um, Sorry, I thought Solidity by example had a mapping. Is this one a good tutorial? I haven't read this one. Oh, this one looks like it's pretty good. I'm gonna drop you this one. And yeah, um, this is really good to explain it too. It's like a telephone book. What does IERC20 stand for? Is it important to understand this naming convention? Yeah, good question. So I, when you see I prepended on a contract name, that usually means interface, of whatever it is. So this is like the I, which stands for like interface of ERC20.sol. Good question. All right, cool. So now that we have this in here, what can we do? Well, we're probably gonna want to write some tests for this. And then let me actually change the name of this contract to state contract. And this will be state contract.t.sol. And we're going to want to test this. So let's go to our test here and we'll rename it um, to stake contract test. And we'll write some tests for it before we'll do that. We'll do forge build to make sure our stake contract is compiling. Uh, of course, it's not compiling um, because I didn't even import everything. Stake returns bool, excuse me. There we go. And now it still won't build because I forgot to import Open Zeppelin. So we need to actually add Open Zeppelin in here. So the way to op the way to add packages in Foundry, like any Open Zeppelin or anything, is we use Forge install. So we're going to do Forge install the Open Zeppelin package, and all we do is we just install the GitHub org name or username and then the repo name. So for here, we would just do open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin hyphen contracts. And this will download this directly from GitHub. It says installed open Zeppelin contracts. If we go into our Git modules, we can now see open Zeppelin is a dependency for this. If we go in our lib, we see we've downloaded Open Zeppelin, which is great. Um, perfect. And then what we'll also have to do, our foundry.toml, we need to tell, we'll need to tell um, Foundry that whenever it sees at Open Zeppelin, it should refer to that package that we just installed here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a remappings, remappings equals and we'll say anytime you see at open Zeppelin, uh, you should point to that lib folder. You should point to lib and then open Zeppelin. So point to lib slash open Zeppelin contracts like that. Now we'll try forge build again. And boom, everything's compiling. Great. We've installed a dependency, we've updated the mappings. Things are looking good. Now we can start writing some tests now that things are actually compiling. Great. So we'll open up stake contract dot T 
dot soul and let's write some tests in here. So what we want to do is let's just let's let's write a test that um, we'll just write a test where uh, what do we want to write a test for? Tokens can be sent to the stake contract. Right? Con that these tokens can be sent. So let's go ahead and set this up. So first thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to import that stake contract at Sol into our test. So our test can use it. And like I said before, in Foundry, all of our tests are written directly in Solidity, which is really powerful. Um, Got a good question from Philip there here though. How do we know when to use IERC20 and when ERC20.sol? So in our state contract here, do we need all of the functions of ERC20? Or do we need all the do we need all the functions defined of ERC20? Like all the all the code actually written. We don't actually need all the code written because we're assuming that all the code for ERC20 is in there. Right, so if you look at IERC20, transfer from doesn't actually define anything, right? There's nothing in here. Approve doesn't define anything. It just says what the function name is. Like there's no code inside this function. Allowances, there's no code inside this. Versus if we go to ERC20.sol, right? If we go to transfer from, there's a bunch of code inside the function, right? We when we're working in here, we don't need to use the implementation with all the code in here, right? We only need, uh, yeah, a humanizer put a, put a good thing. If you take the interface and add an address on top of it, you basically get the contract. Um, so we, we don't need to import that entire ERC20 in here because it'd be a waste of gas, right? It'd be, it'd be over the top. It's not necessary for us to do. So we just want to use the interface. We just want to say, hey, here are the functions we can call. This is the address that has those functions. Go for it. Hopefully that uh, hopefully that helps. Good question. But OK, so we're going to import our staking contract here. And then what we need to do is we need to, in our setup function, we're going to need to create a new state contract. So I'm going to make it a global variable. I'll say state contract public state contract. We'll say state contract equals new state contract. Now we have a state contract, which is great. I'll change this test name to test uh, staking tokens. Like so, and here's where we'll need to stake some tokens. But in order for us to stake some tokens, we're going to need to what? Well, we're going to need to have some tokens that we can actually stake. So what we can do is we could create like a mocks folder and create a mock ERC20, or we could just go ahead and import from Open Zeppelin. And this is where we are going to use the actual contract. And hopefully it'll make sense why in a second. We are going to grab instead of IERC20, we're going to grab the ERC20. Why are we grabbing the ERC20? Well, because we're going to deploy this token. So let me let me just show you. So I'm going to say ERC20 public um, public token. And then we're going to say token equals new ERC20. And then we just got to look at the constructor for this. Constructor. Where it's a name and a symbol. And we'll call it my token comma MT. So why are we using the ERC20 here instead of the IERC20? Well, the reason is we're actually deploying this token here, right? So we're deploying this contract. And when we deploy this contract, we, we actually need all the functions, right? If we were to, de to deploy a contract with an interface, none of these functions are actually defined. So we would deploy it and Solidity would be like, I have no idea what you're trying to do. So we, when we deploy, we actually need those functions defined. The reason in here we didn't was because the contract was already deployed at this token address. 
And we're just saying, hey, that token address is of type ERC-20, and it has all these ERC-20 functions on it. So that's kind of the, that's a little bit more on the difference between those two. So great. So we have a new token here. And what we want to do is we want to test that we can actually send these tokens to this contract. So uh, as we all know, ERC-20s come with like this approve functionality. So we need to approve that our state contract can actually get it. So we'll do token.approve, say address of stake contract. And then say, we'll do some global amount for now. We'll say uh, UN 256 public amount, or we'll do public constant amount equals 1E18. So we'll say, uh, we'll say one token. And then again, E18, because Solidity doesn't work with decimals so well. So one E18 is going to just be one token um, to account for the floating point. So we'll say approve amount. And then we'll call our stake function on our stake contract. So now we'll say stake contract, stake uh, amount address of token and then we'll do assert true uh, of the result of this function so we'll say bool success equals that and then we'll do assert true success Boom. so now we have a minimalistic function that just checks to see if this is returning true when this token is approved and sent successfully so we can do forge, build again, just to make sure everything's compiling. And then we can run forge, test, to test everything. Uh, and we see transfer amount exceeds balance. That's because we forgot to mint some of these tokens. So let's go ahead and mint some of these tokens here. And actually, um, my mistake here, we do have to make a mock because uh, we can't call mint. Uh, actually, I don't think we can call mint. Let me just double check. Mint is internal. Mint's internal, yep. Sorry, we do have to make a mock token, um, but it's going to be real some. Uh, it's it's going to be pretty much the ERC20. So we'll create a mocks folder. Here, we'll do mock. ERC20.sol. And I'm going to do this a little bit quickly. I'm just going to copy paste some code. Um, we're going to use this. It's, it's pretty much exactly the same thing. We just kind of changed its name. And all we're doing now is we just have this mint bit in here. So we're minting uh, tokens so that we can actually use them in our tests. So instead of pulling from Open Zeppelin, we're now going to pull from that mox folder. So dot slash mox slash mock ERC20. Now it's going to be mock ERC20 token, new mock ERC20, and then for the mock, oops, the mock ERC20, we don't have any constructor parameters, so we can just leave it blank like that. Now we can run the test again. Got a different error here. So I import. Uh, well, that's because this is mark your sheet point out. So try this one more time. SRC. It's because this is not where that is located. It's actually located dot dot slash mocks. One more time. And boom. And our test has passed here. So we're getting running one test. Test taking tokens. We see this gas here. Uh, this gas bit here. And of course, if we were to change this to asserting true not success, if we ran the test, it would fail, right? And that's what we expect to see. So cool. So this is pretty similar to what we've already seen. Sure, we made the contracts a little bit more advanced than we did before. But this is basically a testing, uh, um, a simple testing function, right? It's not doing a whole lot. We're just saying, hey, can that token actually work? Any questions up to this point? Any questions up to this point?
Because now I'm going to show you fuzz testing, which is really, really cool. But before we go there, is anybody totally lost? Is anyone like, Patrick, you maniac, what are you talking about? Or are people following along? Are things making sense here? We've got a, a decently sized group, so we can uh, pause for questions here. And then uh, if we have time at the end, we'll save like maybe 15, 10 minutes for either asking any questions or, you know, kind of fiddling around doing whatever you want. Okay, no questions. All right, I'm going to keep going. So, so this is really cool, but there's a testing thing here that we're missing. And what is that thing? So there's this concept in, in computer science called fuzz testing. And actually, let me, I'll just, I'll just look up fuzz testing. And actually, Wikipedia does have a good one. In programming and software development, fuzzing or fuzz testing is an automated software testing technique that involves providing invalid, unexpected, or random data as input to computer programs. So as we know, as smart contract developers, oftentimes people do a lot of random stuff to our contracts. And we're not going to be able to have tested for every single scenario that could happen, right? There could be some totally random nonsense that goes on. So what we want to do is we want to try to improve this test to make it a fuzz test. And by fuzz testing, we mean we send random data to our contract, some random data to our, um, to our function. And now the reason that this is especially interesting um, is you'll, you'll see why in a second. So we're going to send random data to our function uh, and we're going to run this test staking tokens function a ton of times with a ton of random data, right? And this will make our tests way more uh, robust because now even scenarios that we couldn't think of will get caught because the, our fuzz testing will run through them. So what we can do to update this test to make it more robust and for more scenarios is we can pass unit 256 amount. We can pass an amount to our test here. We can pass data as input to our tests and what Foundry will do, and in fact, if we just run this right now, run forge test. Well, first it gives us a warning and saying, hey, you made this parameter that doesn't do anything uh, weird, but okay. Uh, <laughs> What we can see is we see this runs 256. We see some other stuff. Don't worry about that for now. But this runs 256 means it ran this test 256 times with a ton of random stuff for amount here. And so what we can do instead of using this global amount up top, we can use this amount in our functions and now it'll test for kind of random amounts of data or random amounts of tokens. Now, if we run testing again, oh, we actually do see that we figured out a spot where this doesn't work, where this test doesn't work, right? And what's the spot where this test doesn't work? So we see transfer amount exceeds balance. Counter example call data is blah, blah, blah. Args is this. But we're seeing, hey, when we pass this as an input parameter, this test staking tokens failed, right? And maybe, uh, and for this one, the answer is pretty pretty simple, right? The, the simple answer is because our mock ERC-20 right now is only minting this many. And so we're trying to transfer and approve a amount way, way larger. But maybe this would catch something more systemic, right? Maybe you have coded your um, your contract in a way that you only work with uh, ERC twenties that have eight decimals. You only work with uh, you. You have some type of function that stakes stuff, but it doesn't account for the right amount of decimals. And now you've ruined your application forever because you, you've deployed it and you didn't account for these these certain ERC twenty tokens. So fuzz testing is incredibly powerful for us to upgrade our tests and, and make our tests more powerful, so we can do more things. Now, what would be a way we could fix this? Well, if we're doing a UN256 amount, one way we could fix this would be to increase the number that we mint here to being an incredibly, incredibly massive number. Or we could change this to a UN8 
um, excuse me, or UN16, I think a UN16. Let's, let's try UN16. So that the amount that we can transfer is gonna be much less. Okay. So we, we won't hit that threshold of the amount that we can transfer. And we can say, hey, like, great. I, I know UN256 is cool, but we're not expecting anybody to transfer that much. So we can do it like that. Now you see this thing down here, this runs bit. Uh, this runs bit is really cool because we can actually increase the amount of times that we tried it. So we, it tried 256 different numbers. We could increase the number of runs and the number of different numbers it does by popping into our foundry.toml, passing in fuzz runs, and say fuzz runs equals, and we'll do some crazy massive number there. Now when I run this, it'll take a lot longer. And maybe that was too many numbers. <laughs> maybe that was too many runs here. Um, because it's running through all, it's running through this many possible scenarios. So it's running through one, two, three, two, three, ten million scenarios. So that's kind of a lot. So we're actually going to cancel that <laughs> and do uh, 100,000 scenarios because I don't think my computer will be able to handle 10 million. Um, so even 100,000 is going to take a while. Hopefully, hopefully not too long. Hopefully it'll finish within like a, a normal amount of time here. Or maybe it won't. <laughs> uh, you know, let's uh, let's just try a thousand. Let's uh, let's do just a thousand. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so we see a thousand different runs here, um, and we see it's still passed even with a thousand different runs and a thousand different examples. But you can see you can make this incredibly verbose and catch a ton of scenarios you would have never thought of doing this fuzz testing. So that's fuzz testing and it's really, really powerful. And any questions with this, uh, and then I'm gonna move on to working with Chainlink. Uh, we've already seen how to do mocks here, right? We created our own kind of fake token to test the stake, test staking tokens. Uh, and that's essentially exactly what we're gonna do with working with Chainlink. But any questions here? A little confused here. What actually happens when we comment out the global amount? Yes. So when we commented out the global amount, um, in our test staking tokens, instead of using this global amount as input, we're using um, the fuzz value provided by Foundry here. So this amount number is going to be a random number every fuzz, every every Foundry fuzz run, right? So it could be 100, you know, uh, 12,000 the first time. It could be 100 in the next time, and then you know, 26, and then um, you know, two. And then, um, you know, something like that. So when we run our fuzz tests, Foundry just keeps giving random uh, amounts in this amount bit. And if it finds a scenario that breaks our code, it prints it out. So instead of using this amount bit up here that we defined, we're using some random input from Foundry fuzzing. And yes, it is very fast. Do we need to do something special in the test to send the random data to the functions or it is a default setting when we run forge test? Yeah, great question. So when we run forge test, Foundry will automatically look to see if your tests have a, a parameter. So really, if I run uh, forge test here with a thousand pieces, right, we see runs 1000. Now, if I get rid of this and I uncomment out amount, I put a mount back in here. So now we don't have an input parameter for our fuzz testing. We don't see any runs anymore, right? Because it goes, oh, there's no input parameters here. This isn't a fuzz test. All right, I, I won't fuzz test it. And I'm going to put it back and test just to, all right, cool. What's the best way to structure these tests? Is it advisable to have multiple files or different contracts? Is it advisable to have multiple files for different contracts? Yes, it is. And in fact, um, what I recommend checking out is the Foundry Starter Kit. Foundry Starter Kit chain link. I'll post this in the chat. Oh, it's because I'm using Brave Search, and Brave Search is not uh, not loving me right now. Start experimenting with Brave Search. Yeah, whatever. 
Um, chain link GitHub. Great brave search. You're you're getting there. You're, you're getting there. Brave search. Here we go. Posted this in the chat. Um, so this is a repo that we're constantly updating. Foundry keeps getting updated. Foundry keeps getting a ton of new packages and stuff. But if we look in SRC, test, all of the tests for different chain link contracts have their own um, have their own test file. So you can kind of see that as an example of like what to do. Great question. How fuzz tests help? Because in real life, if you pass random data that is too high, a contract will fail. Uh, yes, great question. So Kind of like what we did here, we said, okay, we will just do a UN 256, right? We want to make sure that our code will do exactly what we want it to do. And maybe we want it to work for all UN 2 int 16s, excuse me, all UN 2 int 16s should work, right? Uh, or imagine like a different scenario where we had some random um, in our state contract, we had some weird math where we said at, at some point, for some reason, we said if you into if like if amount equals equals seven, you know, revert. Right? Maybe it sounds silly, but maybe we had some code that did something analogous to this. We would want to catch that. How did Foundry know that one E18 plus one would be a boundary to test with? Because Foundry is dope. That's why. Actually, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> it it probably was just uh, going about its its day. Um, it could have been going up incrementally. I'm not sure. Good questions. How'd you do that click paste uh, with the mouse so fast? Oh, yeah. Um, so what you can do is... Uh, uh, double click a word, copy it, paste it. So double click a word, command C, paste. And then I, I do, I rip around a lot with like, um, if you do like command and option and control, you can like rip around, um, rip around a lot more. There's a lot of like keyboard shortcuts that I kind of do that make life a lot better. Crypto gate 107. Uh, what about my question? I don't see your question. Oh, okay. I see it. Do you mind a quick question about Brownie real quick? Uh, I only see one of two. Sorry, I, 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 I don't see your second question. I might have gotten shadow banned for some reason. Uh, and here's the Foundry Starter Kit. And I have almost no time. Um, ooh, uh, but you just asked a great question. Do you end up with flickering tests? Do the random numbers on one run test fails on another it passes? And yes, you can end up with these flickering tests. Uh, that is a great question. And this is why you want a sufficient number of runs to try to make sure you don't get those flickering tests. You can get... Uh, like the tests pass once and then they don't pass another time. So that is a really good question, right? And if it doesn't pass another time, that should be an indicator. Oh, I should update my fuzz runs so that it does fail every single time. Well, you like and so did that. Yeah. Um, thanks. The the more you uh, the more you fiddle with your code editor, the, the faster you get. Okay, so uh, we have not a lot of time left. So I'm going to quickly try to show you how to do a chain link, uh, a chain link contract here. So what we're going to do, uh, I do have 22 minutes, but I'm trying to explain a lot as I go along. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do, we're going to do a, a price feeds contract. And we're just going to copy paste this, we're going to copy paste this, we're going to create a new uh, file called price consumer v3.sol. Hopefully, you all have used this before, right? It's a minimalistic price consumer. All it's doing is reading from a chain link price feed, right? That is that is it. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all it does. Now, in order for us to run our tests, of course, this here is a hard coded Coven address, Coven Ethereum address. When we're running our Foundry tests, does Foundry have any idea what's on Coven? No, it has no idea, right? No idea what's on Coven since we're trying to run this all locally. So instead of passing um, uh, hard coding an address in here, we're going to add it as an input parameter or address price feed like so. 
and we're just going to have our price feed equal to some price feed that we that we pass in for the constructor here. And then of course we have get latest price function, which just reads the price from a chain link price feed, right? So this is going to be really similar to doing working with that mock ERC twenty, um, but with it with a chain link feed, right? Because again. Foundry and our local networks don't know of oracles. There's no oracle watching our local network, right? There's not. There's no oracle watching our network. Um, hey, Patrick, regarding Brownie, let's say in test expected equals zero, but 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 or anything like 0 0.x gives you the same result. I, uh, I'm not sure what your question is there. Sorry. Um, great. So we have this price consumer. We're going to test this get latest price thing actually does what we want it to do. Now, because this node, or because our local network has no idea what a price feed is, we get to make a, you guessed it, a mock price feed. So we're going to create a new file called mock v3 aggregator. That's all. And we're going to add everything in here. And remember, um, oops, sorry. Do, do, do. That's brownie. Remember, everything that we're doing here is available on that Foundry Starter Kit. Again, I posted it in the chat. Um, please use this as a reference. We're constantly updating it. Foundry is constantly being updated. Foundry is going to come up with a really cool deploy thing soon, uh, which I'm really excited for. Anyways, we're going to make a mock price feed or a mock V3 aggregator. Now, I'm just going to copy paste um, in the interest of time here. You can also find this in SRC, test, mocks, mock v3 aggregator.sol, right? You can find it in our Foundry starter kit. Um, but it's just a minimalistic price feed or a mock v3 aggregator, right? So it has like an update answer function that we can call to update answers, update, uh, update round data, get round data, latest round data. So it has all the functions that a chain link price feed would have. Uh, and we get to control it, right? We get to pretend to be the chain link nodes so we can update this to be whatever we want it to be. So we have this mock now. Let's go ahead and write some tests in here. So we'll create a new test. We'll call it uh, priceconsumer.t.sol. So we know it's a test. We'll do uh, SPDX license. Identifier, MIT, Bagma Solidity, let's do carrot 0 0.8.0, contract, price, consumer, test. And then we have to import DS test, right? It's the same as we saw in here. We got to import this DS test because it's this DS test that it gives us functions like assert true. We're going to import DS test. Oops, excuse me. Import DS test. And let's just make sure all of our stuff is actually compiling because it won't because I forgot to do something. But let's just see it fail. It's going to get mad at this, right? Can't find chain link slash contracts. So guess what we need to do? We guessed it. We need to install it. So we'll do forge install smart contract kit slash. And instead of just installing kind of the normal chain link NPM, we're going to install chain link brownie contracts because this is a repo uh, that's a lot more minimalistic and we can install it a lot faster. So we're going to import that. And then once we do that, we of course need to add, of course, need to add to our remappings. Um, we'll add a little comma here and we'll say, anytime you see at chain link referring to lib slash, um, chain link brownie contracts. I'm going to build this now. Aggregated V interface is not implicitly convertible to type address. That's because we need to. Interface. We need to do what here? Oh, 
Um, oh, wait, it worked that time. Uh... Okay, well, it's uh, compiled that time, so that's cool, I guess. Why did it fail the first time? Did anyone see how it failed the first time? I guess I'd have to go back and see what it did. Maybe I didn't save or something. I probably didn't save. All right, cool. Well, whatever. <laughs> it's working now. Uh, cool. Things are compiling. Let's make this test here because I have 15 minutes. And same thing as before. We're going to need to import dot dot slash price consumer v3 dot soul in here. Um, we're also going to have to import our mocks slash slash dot 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 slash. Where do we put the mocks folder again? There. Mocks slash mock v3 aggregator dot soul. In our price consumer dot test, we need a function set up. Set up, click, and we're going to deploy one of each of these. So we'll say price consumer v3, public price consumer, and then we'll need a mock aggregator. So we'll say mock aggregator v3, public mock v3 aggregator. And in here, we'll say price. Um, first we need to deploy the mock, so we'll say mock v3 aggregator equals new mock v3 aggregator. And what does this take for constructor? Well, let's look for constructor. It takes a decimals and initial answer. So we'll do a unit 256 public constant decimals equals 18. And then a unit 256 public constant, excuse me. This is a uint8, not a uint256, uint8. And this is an int256, public constant init answer equals, and I will say what, one times 10 to the 18th. So, so just one. We'll say the initial answer is one with 18 decimals. So we'll do decimals. We'll pass decimals to the mock aggregator and the initial answer as well. And now that we have our mock deployed, our mock v3 aggregator, we can use that to pass it as a parameter to our price consumer constructor. So we'll say price consumer equals new price consumer, taking in the address of the mock v3 aggregator. Now that we have our function setup done, we can test to see if our get latest price actually works, if it actually calls the price feed from whatever price feed we give it. So we'll do function test consumer turns starting starting value. This would be a public function. Say in 256 price equals price consumer dot get latest price, right? Because again, Get latest price is going to return this price here. So we want to make sure. And then we just want to make sure that this price is going to be the same as the initial answer. So we'll just say assert true. Price equals equals. Did answer and boom. Now we can run. Forge test. We ran into an issue here. Assert true undeclared identifier. That's because we need this to inherit our DS test. So we're going to say um, price consumer test is DS test, right? Because if we don't inherit it, we're not going to get any of the functionality from this. Run forge test again. What do we get this time? Name refers to a struct, you know, more contract. It's new. This the variable name, we need to give it the the actual contract name, so with a capital M, you see the difference there? Boom, 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 boom. So it needs to be a capital M. Let's try this again. Okay, now we're now we actually are getting that error from before. That's so weird, right? Because when we were in forge build. Yeah, so now it's now it's failing correctly. Type contract aggregator v3 interface is not implicitly convertible to expected type address. So 
This is saying type contract aggregator v interface, and this is here. That should work. The shadow declaration. Oh, there's a shadow deck. Oh, that's oh duh. It's because it's uh, it's because um, price my address price feed and the global price feed had the same variable name. Oopsies. All right, cool. That's why I put that underscore there. That makes more sense. All right, cool. Um, unknown program name solidity. I also can't spell solidity. Solidity. All right, cool. There we go. Now that things are working, let's run Forge Test. And great. And we see both of those pass, right? And we see our fuzz test was still run as a fuzz test. And we see our normal test was run um, as a normal test here. So, so that's how we do it with Chainlink contracts. Uh, and if we wanted to, we could call, we could even do something like mock up, mock v uh, 3 update answer. And then we could update the answer to something and then test to make sure that even that was true. We would pretend to be the Chainlink node. We would mock being a Chainlink node uh, and go from there. All right, great. Please, is there a more in-depth tutorial on Chainlink VRF? There is a, a Chainlink VRF video on the Chainlink YouTube. So be sure to check that out if you're looking for more in-depth on Chainlink VRF. Throughout the hackathon, we've been using Coven Test Network. Is there any particular reason why we're using it over more popular ones like Rinkby and Robson? Great question. Um, and the answer is kind of convoluted. The There's no best test net. In fact, all three of those are getting deprecated at some point or, uh, or removed. Um, there's a lot of support for Coven. Uh, on on a lot of DeFi protocols and that's that's the reason why it was originally chosen like so for example ave ave's test net um, of choice was coven for a really long time um also from a stability standpoint um i mean i've been doing this for a few years now coven for me has always been the most stable like there have been times when rink bees out robson goes down for months it, it seems and coven's been re the most stable um so that's basically why um but uh, Rinkby also works. There's documentation for Rinkby for most chains. And actually, uh, the Chainlink docs are, are being moved over to more heavily focused Rinkby. Um, but probably in six months to a year, it's probably going to be uh, Gorilla or Cephalia. Um, yeah, t test nets are constantly in flux. Does it make sense to mix Foundry and Brownie? Let me actually just switch over to Hi. Welcome back. Ooh. How's it going? Um, does it make sense to mix Foundry and Brownie? I mean, using Foundry for test and Brownie to write deploy scripts. If you want to do that, absolutely. Like, that sounds awesome. Um, if you like writing your deploy scripts in Brownie or you like interacting with your code in Brownie, you can absolutely mix them, right? Actually, uh, about a year, <clears throat> about a year, a year and a half ago, the most pop, one of the most popular setups was using Truffle and Hardhat. So... If you want to use Brownie and Foundry here, absolutely go for it, right? Because like, like I said, Foundry is still waiting for their, um, is still building out their deploy feature. You're using price sheet as method argument and smart contract state variable. Yes, thank you. Good call. I uh, didn't read the chat. I should have read the chat. Tell me more about not having the right chance. Yes, you were right. Awesome. So we have seven minutes left here. Hopefully you all learned something. And before people leave, um, please, 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 let me uh, pull up that community form. Uh, where is it? I just had it. I just sent it to you all. Uh, please fill out the feedback form so we can get uh, feedback on if you like this, if you didn't like this. But yeah, we have a couple minutes left. So are there any questions? Did that make sense to everybody? Or are people like, I'm kind of lost. Or was it cool to watch me rip around the, the, the code editor? I guess that that was kind of fun. Um, uh, any questions on Foundry, Hackathon, anything at all? Anybody want to see some see something real quick in the in the six minutes that we have? Also, the the next couple of workshops get really really cool. Um, so be sure to go to the next couple of workshops um, later on today. 
Uh, af right after this, we have testing with Truffle, which is going to be awesome. We have building full stack dApps with Ivan on Tech. We have Alchemy. Then we also have testing with Anchor uh, if you're interested in Solana. So testing with Anchor. And then tomorrow, we're, we're really ramping up. We're doing four hours of end-to-end -end project creation. So we're going to build a DeFi staking application. Uh, and then we're also going to build uh, an NFT using IPFS tomorrow. So those are ones you're definitely going to want to see. If you're interested in DeFi, interested in NFTs or gaming, those are like end-to-end -end build, build, a, build a contract. So you definitely want to see those. Is there any chance the VRF or any Chainlink Oracle uh, call could not respond to a call at all? Amazing question. So um, yes, and, and this is why the Chainlink uh, network is decentralized. And that's why there's a bunch of nodes. In the same sense, like an Ethereum Oracle, or excuse me, an Ethereum, an Ethereum node, a Polygon node, uh, an Avalanche node, um, you know, an Arbitrum node, et cetera, they could all stop processing blocks. And then what happens? Well, nobody cares because there are other uh, there are other nodes that do the exact same thing. So, yes, they could not respond, but that's why you make them decentralized. This is super helpful, and using Brownie and Foundry seems super powerful. Yes, it definitely is very powerful. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What command should I use if I don't want to install Brownie like you did in the session? Uh, if I don't want to install Brownie, I mean, we use Foundry here, so you don't need to use Brownie. I'm not sure I understand your question. Sorry. All right, cool. Well, great. Glad this was helpful. So. We have a couple minutes left here, so plenty of time for questions. Is my water up here? I'm thirsty. If not, uh, be sure to go to uh, Soul's workshop right after this. Which is going to be testing with Truffle. So really powerful framework. The OG of frameworks. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. In the next workshops, when we build a project, which framework will we use? Or can we use any framework we want while following the tutorial? Yes. So all the Solidity code is going to be exactly the same. And it doesn't matter what framework you use, right? Brownie, Hardhat, Foundry, Truffle, Apeworks, you know, uh, Anchor, whatever. Well, except for Anchor. So all the tutorials are going to be EVM compatible. So you can use whatever framework you want. For like testing, building, and deploying, um, that's the part we will use a framework for. Um, but we'll try to do that kind of quick. So all the Solidity will be the, exactly the same. Um, and like, if you're, if you want to follow along, um, you can follow along with the code. And then if you use a different framework than I'm using for the video, then you would just um, try to transpile, you know, whatever I've written in Brownie or Foundry or, or Hardhat into, you know, whatever framework that you're using. Great question. If you're, yeah, if you're working with Hardhat, uh, not much to see here. Is Foundry going to suffer a big change slash upgrade soon? I, I think suffer is the wrong word. I think it's going to uh, implement a big change in a positive way. Uh, it's going to have a, uh, it's, they're adding a deploy feature that just makes deploying code a lot easier. And they're planning on having it be in Solidity, which is really crazy. So you'll deploy your code in Solidity and, excuse me, you'll write your code in Solidity and deploy it in Solidity, which is really interesting. What command do I use if I want to use Brownie with Foundry? Uh, Brownie init and forge init. You would, you would just do that. What is the go-to uh, for list data oracles? Uh, that will be docs.chain.link. Actually, let me just give you a docs.chain.link. You'll go to EVM chains or whatever chains you want, and then contract addresses, reference addresses. So that'll be right here. And then whatever, um, you know, if you're using Ethereum, Avalanche, uh, BSC, um, Polygon, whatever, uh, pick your chain and find the contract addresses. I use the Solidity to deploy the Solidity. <laughs> That's funny. Is learning hard hat enough or should we learn Truffle Browning set to pick one framework and just use that framework? Pick one framework and go. Uh, do not especially if you're starting out in this space, do not spend time 
learning all the frameworks, learning, you know, collecting all the infinity stones. Do not do that. Pick one and go to town, right? They're each really powerful. Um, they'll each get the job done. It doesn't really help you as a, as a developer learning a ton of them, right? Because they're just different ways to, to, uh, to implement it. But with that being said, it's 830. I'm going to jump off. If you're interested in learning how to test with Truffle, definitely go to that. Sol will be running that workshop and we'll see you all. Bye.